Well, I am so grateful that the Lord uses Wheaton Athletics to encourage our students in their Christian faith and to develop character. And it's with that mission in mind that it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you today's chapel speaker. Many of you know Coach Swider as a successful football coach. He's achieved an incredible winning percentage, one of the highest in all of Division III. But more important than his 148 wins is the way Coach Swider uses his platform to challenge people in their walk with Christ. Coach Swider is a highly sought after public speaker who travels the country not only talking about his faith, but more importantly, living it out every day. Coach Swider graduated with honors from Wheaton in 1977, has two sons that are Wheaton students, and is a diehard Green Bay Packer fan. I am proud to call him a colleague and grateful for his contribution to our campus. Thank you, men. <laughs> I appreciate that respect. No, it really is. It's a privilege to be here, uh, more than you could ever imagine. And listening to those two testimonies, I don't know if uh, President Reichen is here, maybe he's in his office listening. That justifies our budget. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, we can talk about wins, we can talk about home runs, we can talk about touchdowns and baskets, fast runners, strong weightlifters. But hearing those two student athletes share about their experience is worth every single nickel that this place puts into athletics. And I just want you guys to know that I'm really proud to be associated with you. I see our coaches over here and come to support me, and I I'm, I'm, uh, just feel a great privilege to be a part of Wheaton College. Um, you notice I have my game attire on. I know my players will see that. There's no sweats today. This is, uh, this is game day, and uh, since it's an athletic Chapel, I am going to say, go Thunder. Uh, I had to get that in. I know Chaplain Keller was a little bit leery about me saying that, but uh, <laughs> I'm up here now, so there's not much you can do. <laughs> the other thing is, I look out there, I see some empty seats. Better not be any of our football guys not here today. <laughs> I am going to check with the monitors. One of you guys not here, 6 a.m. tomorrow, Macaulay Field. <laughs> you guys right now are dead men walking. <laughs> Maybe we ought to have everybody join us tomorrow, right, Chaplain Kell? <laughs> Increase this chapel attendance a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Hard to believe, 41 years ago, I came to Wheaton College as a freshman. Hard to believe, 41 years goes by like that. And I had the privilege of experiencing Wheaton through the eyes of a, of a student athlete, through the eyes of a student. And for that four-year period from 1973 to 1977, my life was changed. It was marked in a lot of ways. I see, see myself just like these athletes right here. Wheaton had a profound influence on me, and I saw Wheaton through that lens. I was a student athlete when I came here 41 years ago. I think that, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Amstutz, is he here today? He was, he was my political science teacher. I think he's still here. And Larry Funk was my chem teacher. I think Larry's still here. Uh, just guys like that, besides the coaches, that really had a, a, just a profound influence on me, inspired me and challenged me and had a radical impact on my life 41 years ago. 29 years ago, in 1985, I returned here as a coach. And so I began to see Wheaton through the lens of a coach. For 29 years, I've had the privilege of being called a coach, the honor of being called a coach. And I've seen Wheaton through the lens that's a little different than that of a student athlete, in a position of responsibility to inspire Young athletes, not only to achieve, but to have an experience like you just heard about here. And then four years ago, my oldest son, Justin, came to Wheaton, and two years ago, my second son, Michael. And I have seen Wheaton through the lens of a parent. Three different sets of lenses. I don't know how many have had the privilege of looking at it 
for those three sets. A student athlete, a coach, and now a parent. I'm blessed. And I just want to encourage all of you right now and today and for the rest of your time at Wheaton College before we get started, take full advantage of this place. No place is perfect. I'm not trying to set this up to be heaven. I'm not trying to set this up to be utopia. It's Wheaton College and we live on the planet Earth. But appreciate what you got. Invest in it. Develop relationships. And take advantage of the opportunity God has given you here. And I say that after seeing it since 1973 through three different sets of lenses. And for the last 29 years, I've also been recruiting athletes. Probably more athletes than any of the coaches, not because football is a better sport, but just because of the numbers. 29 years, I've got to bring in a lot of players. Maybe even more than admissions. And I've been in homes around the country. explaining what's Wheaton all about to young people that are not coming because a family member has been here, but young people are coming just because I walked in their house and I got their name and it's the first they ever hear about Wheaton. And so you're staring at a young man in California and Florida and Texas somewhere, they don't know anything about Wheaton, and you're trying to say, here's why you should come up and spend your winters in minus 10 degrees <laughs> with 30 inches of snow on the ground. And I find myself selling not the great academic opportunities here, although they are great. I find myself selling not the athletic opportunity, even though it's an athlete. You know what I find myself selling? The experience that Wheaton's going to provide and the distinctive experience that Wheaton's going to provide. And what I say, and my coaches have heard me use these words all the time, I say, nowhere else where you're going to go to college and be encouraged to walk with God like you will at Wheaton. It's not perfect. We're not perfect. But as I challenge these young people, I say, find another four-year institution where you can receive an Ivy League-like degree, where you can play a sport and play for a winner, but most importantly, you can be encouraged by this environment to walk with God. And that's why they come. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. I want to talk to you, and I only got a few minutes. Oh my gosh, I got nine minutes left. We got to change gears a little bit here. I might go overboard a little bit, Chaplain Kello. <laughs> what does it mean to walk with God? What is that? And my whole purpose for being up here, I'm not into just transferring information to you, okay? This isn't, I have information, I'm going to transfer it to you. This is about inspiring you. This is about challenging you. This is about confronting you. This is about encouraging you. That's what we do with our athletes as coaches. We just don't transfer information to them. We inspire them. Sometimes we challenge them. Sometimes we confront them. Sometimes we encourage them. And above all else, it's to walk with God, just as you heard right here. So eloquently said, I got five things. You heard the scripture, and I'm going to have to run in a hurry here. I got five things that I want to inspire you to do. These are the dynamics. These are the characteristics of somebody who's walking with Jesus. The first, as you heard earlier this morning, Psalm 111.10 the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, is the beginning of wisdom. And the problem today is we live in a culture that fears man. We are more worried about what man thinks, about what culture thinks, about what the environment I am in thinks, than what God thinks. It's called peer pressure, and we think it's relegated to junior high students. I have a daughter at Franklin Middle School. She comes home all the time as we battle peer pressure. My response to is, as it always is, fear God, Hannah. Fear God. Don't worry about it. It says in Psalm, Hannah, fear God. That is where your accountability lies. That's your maker. That's the God that blew, blew breath into your very body. Fear him. 
And when I say fear, be accountable to him. I've said this many, many times, that if I die the same time my dad died, I'm living three more years. It's ticking, isn't it? You think I'm worried about what you people think of me? I'm going to see God three years. You got to be kidding me if I'm worried about you, with all due respect. <laughs> now, you know what? I could see him tomorrow, couldn't I? And so could you. You ready for that meeting? And we live in a culture that acts as if that meeting will never take place. Shame on us. Someday, we're going to be at the foot of our maker. And on the backside of that meeting is eternity. The backside of my meeting with you guys is tomorrow. Live a life of accountability to God first. And you know what you'll be? You'll be a difference maker. You won't be some amoeba that forms a piece of milk toast that forms to your environment. You'll be someone who stands up in your environment and you'll be a young man or woman of conviction. And you will be a difference maker and you will walk with God. Number two, trust God. We heard it read, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? He will make your path straight. Who do you trust, you or God? We want answers, don't we, all the time. I get athletes, they come into my office, and they've had some tragedy, some event, some injury, whatever it is, and they come into me, and they want answers. Why, 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 why? And I sit and I pray with them. I put my arm around them. You know what we pray for? A greater capacity to trust. The ultimate act of arrogance is to say, even if God told us, we can understand them. I want an answer. I'm a human being. I'm finite. And I want an answer from an infinite God. And I want it now. Arrogance. It says trust. I use the example all the time. My two sons, they're five years old. They run into the street chasing a ball. I grab them. I smack them on the backside. Now, in our culture, maybe that's wrong, but I don't care because I fear God. <laughs> okay? And I smack him on the backside, and I say, you can't do that. Five years old, Michael thinks the car's going to get hurt, not him. Okay? And they look at me like I've just caused pain. I, you know, I, don't, I grab him, I just say, listen, trust me. I love you. Trust me. I'm 45 years old. You're five. Take advantage of my 45 years and become the smartest five-year-old on the planet. <laughs> and I keep doing that. They're 15, 16, 17. I don't spank them anymore, but I challenge them. And I do things that create pain. My premise is not to create pain. It's to get them somewhere that I know because I love them. And then my wife tells me when I go home and I'm frustrated and I'm angry, she says, trust God, you're 59, take advantage of his infinite wisdom and become the smartest 59-year-old on the planet. Whoa, she just got me, didn't she? <laughs> trust God. He loves you. His motive is not pain. His motive is growth and an end product that we have finite minds can't understand. If you're walking with God, you trust God. Three, and I have got a rock here. Number three. Seek God. Matthew 6.33, you heard it read, we read. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. And we live in a culture, you know what we do? We seek these things first. And we never find the kingdom of God. It's not wrong to seek wins. It's not wrong to seek money in a business world. It's not wrong to seek attention. It's not wrong to seek advancement. It's when you seek those first that we lose out and we prostitute ourselves and compromise ourselves because we haven't first sought the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek that first. I tell our coaches before every season begins, I say, listen, coaches, and I got a bunch of them sitting here. Thanks for coming, man. God bless you guys. I say, guys, we're going to be confronted with a thousand decisions over the next four months, okay? We're starting our season. It's August. Don't ask yourself, will it help us win? Ask yourself, is it right or wrong? Don't ask yourself, because you know, if we do, we ask yourself, will it help us win? We start margining right and wrong. I speak to businesses. I said, if I was running your business, 
Here's what I would say. Don't ask yourself what will help us make money. Ask yourself first, is it right or wrong? If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, don't. Make enough right choices, we'll make our money. But what happens is we seek those things, and we compromise ourselves, and we never find the kingdom of God. So whatever you do, whatever God calls you to do, doesn't mean don't go for all of it. But seek God first. And then all those things, ultimately, in God's due time, will be added unto you. Number four, reject the philosophy of this world. I left Wheaton College in 1977. I went to Indiana University Graduate School. I still got the sheet of paper here. Not for my graduation. I, I did graduate. But I did go to Indiana. Then I went down to Atlanta, Georgia. I coached high school football in Atlanta, Georgia for seven years. My parents sent me this, this sheet of paper right here. They sent me this verse on a regular basis, my first time out of the house. Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ, see to it no one takes you captive, Mike, through the philosophy and the tradition of men rather than according to Christ. And we live in a world that has been taken captive by the philosophy of men. It also says in Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. God's not going to be mocked. You will reap what you sow. Not going to get away with it. 1 Corinthians 3, 19 says, I will make foolish the wisdom of this world. And he's doing it right in front of our very eyes. You're walking with God. Reject the philosophy of this world and accept the philosophy of the creator of life who probably knows best how to live it if he made it. And the final one here, and we go, don't ever forget the cost of your salvation. The great song I was just saying here a moment ago, his wounds paid my ransom. Don't forget what he did. I use this example again all the time with our players. I'll take my son Michael. We'll be out in the field before Easter I do this. And I'll take Michael and I'll put my arms around Michael. And I'll say, here's the deal. I'll talk to our football team. I'll talk to you today. Pretend Michael's standing up here. I'm not going to call him up. I'll embarrass him. Okay? He better be here. Wherever you are, you better be here, Michael. All right. You got my name, man. All right. So I get Michael and I put Michael up here. Okay? And I say, here's the deal. All of you are condemned to die. All of you. You're condemned to die. We got a plan. We, not me, we. Here's the plan. He dies, you live. Whoa. You're condemned to die in a week, whatever it is. He dies, my son. You live. And here's the deal, he because he knows what he's got to do out of obedience, he sweats blood the night before. Now, I have an athlete, we've got a lot of athletes, I've never seen blood being sweat, ever. He sweats blood in apprehension and anxiety of knowing what's going to happen, because he's in on the plan. Okay, then the next day, my son gets beaten beyond human recognition, I don't even recognize him. And I allow it to happen. I could have stopped it. And then they spike his hands into the cross and he suffocates and he dies. You guys live. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Would you ever be ashamed of me in public? Would you ever be embarrassed? Would you ever be embarrassed to be associated with me? Would you ever forget me? Would you ever not talk to me? Not seek me? Would you ever reject my counsel? Would you ever not trust me? Would you? If you did, it would pain me. And that's what we do. Don't forget, you're walking with God, don't forget the cost of your salvation. So quickly here, fear God, trust God, seek God, reject the philosophy of this world. Don't forget the cost of your salvation. 
Today I want to inspire all of you and me to walk with God and impact this world, like it says on that sign, for Christ and his kingdom. Okay? And as I tell our team when we break before a game, let's roll. You are dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.